We all, if you haven't been here, we're going to play catch up real quick. We're in a new series that we started last week, and the series is called Us Versus Them. And it's all about breaking the mentality that it's the church versus the world. Um, and so we, we see this all across uh, in, in the history of the church. We've seen the church versus the world. In church world today, all over the place, we see the church versus the world. You hear guys that are giving prophetic messages. It very much seems like it's the church versus the world, like we're anti the world. And that's not at all what the Bible talks about. That's not what Jesus teaches. And we've been talking about what our relationship as a believer, what our relationship as a child of God, as a disciple of Jesus, what our relationship looks like to the unbelieving world around us. And last week, the title of the message was Salt and Light. We had a lot of fun with that. Talked about how eggs always need salt. And everybody said, if you eat your eggs without salt, you are a weirdo. Amen. I mean, so so there's different things that you just got to have salt. So we talked about what does it look like to be salt and to be light? Jesus told us you are to be the salt of the earth and you are to be the light of the world. And so how do we apply that to our life? At the end of those scriptures, this is what he said. He said, let your good deeds shine out. Everybody say shine out. Let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly father. That is what our relationship to the world should look like. Our relationship should look like I am being salt. I am being light. How am I being salt and light in Jesus? I'm doing that by 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 letting my good deeds shine out for all to see. When I'm giving good deeds, I'm being the person that Christ has called me to be. My favorite quote from the message last week was this one. You may never know what results come from your actions, but if you do nothing, there will be no results. That's so good. If you didn't memorize that, you should, you should memorize it. One way to say that again is good intentions don't save anyone. Amen? Amen. We all got good intentions. We all love to pray, but good intentions won't save anyone. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying we got to get to work, y'all. Amen? We got to get to work. Let your actions, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. As I'm diving into the content for this week, I want to throw something out there for you to think about. I believe oftentimes the longer that we stay in church and come to church, the more tempted we are to allow the church to be our comfort spot, the church to be the place where we are comfortable. Here's what happens. So you come to church and you get saved And you're like rocking all about Jesus. He just changed my life and I'm giving everything to him and I'm joining the church and all the things. And then what happens is you find a little group of friends that you really like in the church, right? And then you keep coming to church and now it's been like two years and God's still stretching you a little bit. But now it's it's really, it's more of a social place that you come. And when I'm getting up in the morning for church, am I thinking, man, God's going to rock my world today. What is it that he has for me today? Or am I thinking, oh, yeah, I get to see him at church. Maybe we'll go eat with them at church. And so it becomes, if we're not careful, it becomes this like comfortable social environment where we get to go hang out with my people. Amen. Listen, y'all, my people, I like to hang out with y'all. But there's also this danger in allowing ourselves to get comfortable inside the church because it is human nature that when we get comfortable, we stop allowing ourselves to be stretched. When we get comfortable, we take less risks than if we weren't comfortable. Anybody ever felt comfortable before? You guys are quiet. Y'all been quiet a lot lately. I don't know what y'all's deal is, but y'all better pipe up a little bit. Listen, honestly, one of the greatest fears that we should have is the fear that the church world gets so comfortable that we're not doing the mission that Jesus has called us to do because we're just loving hanging out with each other. That is not what he's called us to do. He has called his church to shine out, to be the light on the lampstand that we talked about last week. And we cannot do that if we're comfortable sitting in the chairs. Amen. Amen. As believers, we have been called to reach the lost and the hurting. This church is not a social club. It should be a hospital for the hurting. You know, as you walk into the foyer, and you begin to leave the four you. Anybody ever walk through that hallway over there? As you walk into that hallway, there's my favorite picture in the entire church. 
You leave here, you walk into that hallway, and then boom, it's like throwing up at you. It's a big battleship. Anybody see that picture? And on the battleship, here's what it says. It says, this church is a battleship, not a cruise boat. This church is a battleship, not a cruise boat. What are you saying, Pastor? I mean, if you're comfortable chilling and getting your coffee and not ever doing anything and not training to be a warrior in the kingdom of God, you got some work to do. Because this is a battleship. It's not a cruise boat. Church should never be a place where we only hang out, have a good time, and love to eat. Although at Clawson, we love to hang out. We love to have a good time. And dadgum, we love to eat. And I'm putting myself right there, baby. But that should not be what we are about. We should be about being trained to be the warriors that God has called us to be in the army. The Bible talks about being in the army of Christ. I can't be in the army of Christ without training. I can't be in the army of Christ if I'm comfortable. Do you know how to train to be a warrior in the U.S. military? Listen, they work you till you puke your guts out. Till you can't move no more from dawn to dusk. What are you saying? I'm saying the army of Jesus Christ has got some work to do if we're going to go fight on Satan's territory. Amen. We got to train. We got to work on the kingdom, not focused on being served. So the message this morning goes along with that thought process. And if you're taking notes, the title to the message is a hospital for the hurting. Now, this message is really near and dear to my heart because it's one of my greatest passions. And if you have your Bible, I'm going to ask you to turn with me to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. If you don't have a Bible, you can pull it up on your phone or you can just read it. They'll they'll have it up on the screen. Luke chapter 5. I'm going to start reading in verse 27. Luke chapter 5, verse 27. It says, Later, as Jesus left the town... He saw a tax collector named Levi. Everybody say Levi. Levi. That's my dog's name, Levi. <laughs> Sitting at his tax collector's booth. Now listen to this, it's so cool. Follow me and be my disciple. Then Jesus said, to, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up and left everything and followed him. Later, Levi held a banquet at his home with Jesus as the guest of honor. Many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests also ate with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples, why do you eat and drink with such scum? And Jesus answered them, probably my favorite moment ever in the history of Jesus right here. Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come to call not those who think that they are righteous, but those who know that they are sinners and need to repent. Everybody say mic drop. It's my favorite mic drop moment that Jesus has. The the, the religious people are complaining. Why are they complaining? Because Jesus, the king, the man, instead of hanging out with them and giving them all his attention and all the things, and then he's, he's hanging out over here with the sinners. And so they look at him hanging out with the sinners. And the Bible says that he begins to complain, that they begin to complain. They begin to murmur. And then he says to them, beautiful, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. And then the roasting session. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know that they're sinners and they need to repent. Heavenly Father, I come to you right now. God, help us us to be the church that you've called us to be. Help us to be the people that you called us to be, just like we looked at last week. Help us to be salt and to be light. Help us to allow our good deeds to shine out so that everyone can give you honor and so that your love and your name can be spread throughout the world. Lord, we love you and thank you and praise you. In your precious name we pray, amen. Listen, as we dive into the the meat of this message, I have three points that I want to share with you concerning being a hospital for the hurting. And if you're taking those, point number one is this. Jesus did not conform to the world. He transformed the world. Jesus did not conform. He transformed. You know, I don't know about you guys, but there is, I know in my life, there's always a little piece of me that wants to make the people around me happy, right? 
even though I don't always, I want to make my parents happy. I want to make my wife happy. Sometimes that's challenging. Anybody married? I want to make my kids happy. I want to make my friends happy. I really want to make my church happy. And so there's this temptation to do what other people want me to do to make them happy. Anybody ever uh, give in to that temptation a little bit? Let me tell you a funny story about me conforming to what others wanted me to do. So this is going to be, I hope this is appropriate and it's not. It's like maybe gray, a little gray, but we're going to go with it anyway. So when I was, when I was coming up as a kid, my mom bought us whitey tidy underwear. Like that's, that's what we wore. As I, coming up as a kid, I didn't know anything. To, I mean, sometimes I had like Superman or Spider-Man. When you do that, you sag a little bit so you can show homeboys off, right? You got the heroes on, you're going to show them off. But, uh, but for the most part, it was always, I didn't know there was this whole boxers versus briefs thing, you know? Coming up as a kid, I'm not buying my own underwear, so I'm not thinking about all that. And so coming up, you know, I've, I've, I'm, in, I'm in sixth grade. We moved to Central from Carthage in sixth grade. And, and in seventh grade, I joined the basketball team. So in seventh grade, I make the basketball team. First day in the locker room, we go down. I'm all pumped and excited. My friends are in basketball. And I strip down, and I start to put my basketball shorts on, and somebody busts out laughing. They said, Josh, you one of them whitey tidy boys, huh? <laughs> and I look around the room, and everybody in there got boxers on. I got whitey tighties on. And so I look over, and I thought, oh, God, what do you say? What do you say? What do you Nah, bro, I ain't no whitey tidy man. My boxers are all dirty. And I got up this morning, this is all that I had clean, so I put them on. <laughs> Those were my brand new school underwear, too, right there. <laughs> so, so listen, listen, what happened was, after that day, there was never another day that I wore whitey tidy underwear. If I didn't have boxers, we're going commando. But we ain't going back to no whitey tidy underwear. You know why? Because I was completely embarrassed in the locker room. I don't even think I told my mom about that. I just went out and borrowed some of my friend's boxers, and then I bought me some boxers later on. But that's how I moved from whitey tidies to going to boxers. You know what happened? I conformed to what other people wanted me to do. Right now, I'm kind of glad that I did. But usually, <laughs> usually, you don't conform to what other people want you to do just because other people want you to do it. You transform with your presence. Somebody say amen. 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 Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. Let's get into the Bible now so we can get off that. It says, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. Listen to me now. As believers, as the church, as Jesus' followers, we have got to understand that our role is to offer transformation to the world through Christ, never to allow ourselves to be conformed. We have got to guard our hearts against being conformed to the world so that we can be like Christ. And can I be honest with you? The, the, The younger that you are, and your Christian walk, probably the most challenging that this is. You know why? Let me tell you why. Also, the younger that you are, typically the more passionate you are about Jesus. And so what happens is you get saved. I don't know about you, but I remember when I got saved. I got saved June of 2005. When you get saved, what happens is, I'm going to use this altar as as an illustration. You get up from this altar and you are completely different. Now, there's a process, a sanctification process, where you learn what good things you should do and what bad things you should not do. You're not perfect when you get up from the altar, but you're different inside when you get up from the altar. And so what happens is you get up from the altar, and God begins to do some great things in your life, and he begins to restore your marriage, and he begins to to, to do great things inside of you. And what happens is because you're passionate about Jesus Christ and seeing and, 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 and you want other people to be passionate about Jesus Christ, what you do is you start going out, and you want to tell the people that you used to hang out with that still struggle with the things that you still probably are struggling with inside, you want to go to them, and you want to share Christ with them. So you get this picture in your mind of what this is going to look like. I'm going to go, I'm going to go to party night tonight and they're going to be drinking around the bonfire. 
So he's going he's to be high. I know him. He's going to be out of there, blow it out of his brains. And what's going to happen is I'm going to go and I'm going to begin to share with him what God is doing in my life. And when I share with him what God is doing in my life, they're going to chunk their beer bottles in the fire and the revival is going to take place. They're going to hit their knees and bam, everybody's going to give their life to Jesus. You're like pumped. Like, ooh, come on, Satan. I ain't scared. Right? That's what happens when you give your life to Jesus. So what happens? You go to the bonfire. And you begin to share what Jesus has done with your life. And you know what they do? They begin to laugh at you. (laughs) Bro, give yourself like three weeks. In three weeks, you're going to be pulling one out the cooler too. Just give yourself three weeks. And so you have this picture because God's doing something in you and it was genuine and it was real and it was awesome. You've now put yourself in an environment that you can't handle because you're a baby Christian. And so at first, you're just kind of drawn back and you're taking like, man, that wasn't supposed to happen like that. They need me to do it again. So then you go back and you put yourself in that environment. Why? Because you have good intentions, because you want to see them change their life. But what happens is you continue to put yourself in this environment where you are being tempted to sin and you are getting discouraged because nobody's following you. And instead of you gathering with other believers and getting stronger, you're getting with people of the world. And you know what happens? What happens is is you wake up and you're drinking. You wake up one day and you're the guy that's high by the fire. And you're going, how did I get here? I know that what happened to me at church was real. I know that God saved me. And Satan goes, you don't know nothing. If he saved you, would you be doing what you're doing right now? And so what happens is you get passionate, you get excited, you get like, oh, I'm going to change the whole dead gum world. And then you go and you try to change the world, but you're not ready because you don't have these people around you that are helping you move. And what happens is you fall right back into temptation. And when you fall right back into temptation, then you fall again and then you think you're a failure and then you fall again and you begin to wonder if God's even real and then you fall again and then you go back to the things in the world instead of following Jesus. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Amen. So, Pastor Josh, when the, what in the world does that have to do with being a hospital for the hurting? Here's how. If we're going to be successful with being a hospital for hurting people, we have to remember is that our job, our first job is ourself. If I'm conforming to the patterns of this world, if I'm getting tempted and falling into temptation, if I'm going around the wrong people and being stupid with them, how could I ever be a hospital for hurting people? I have to first work on myself before I can be the hospital that God's called me to be, before I can ever be the doctor that helps somebody else or the drug addict that used to be a drug addict that pulls people out of addiction. I cannot be an addiction if I want to pull somebody else out of addiction. I have to work on me first. Do not conform to the world, but be transformed. Listen, we do not hang around with bad company to be influenced by bad company. We do hang out with bad company, but the reason being is so we can influence them. Jesus didn't eat with the sinners and the tax collectors to have fun. He ate with the sinners and the tax collectors to let his good deeds shine out. For all to see. And after he shined his good deeds, those that followed him, he took them and they went. And those that didn't, he got himself out of there. But he did not hang out in a place that was going to cause him to fail. Just like we should follow that same example. Somebody say amen. Amen. Here's a a quote I want to give you that I love that I found this week. It says, we must desire to touch every person's life, but not every person gets access to ours. We must desire. I want to touch everyone. I want to share the gospel with everyone. I want my good deeds to shine out for everyone. But their deeds are not influencing my life. They don't get to touch my life. I'm touching their lives. Listen, we can't help transform people who are hurting if we ourselves are not being transformed. So we show love to everyone. We don't turn anyone away. But at the same time, we do not make unhealthy connections 
We guard our hearts and we foster good relationships. Can I say too that if you're not intentional about keeping those relationships out of your life, then Satan will be very intentional about manipulating you into getting into those relationships. What do you mean, pastor? Listen, when I got saved, if you're a man, you you might can relate. When I got saved, all of the fine Jezebels of this world started running after me. It wasn't the Christian ones. It was the Jezebels. They started, you know, you think that was an accident? No, that wasn't an accident. I couldn't have picked them up before then. I'm not that good. No, Satan is that good. And so what Satan did was he goes, I know how I'm going to make him fall. I'm going to make him fall with a woman. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put that woman, boom, right in his face. You gave your life to Jesus. Whoa, Jesus, you look pretty good at That's what happens. Somebody say amen. He tries to influence your life with bad relationships. How about this one? When I got saved, people that I ain't talked to in years, that's living out crazy in the world, they want to get to know me now. Somebody say, oh, well, that's Jesus opening the door. Is it? Or is it Satan opening the door for me to get an influence in my life? You think that's an accident that people just call you after you, you get saved. You're trying to be transformed. Now your people from 10 years ago is calling you want to hang out. He's good, y'all. Yeah. He is very intentional about trying to stop what God is doing in your life. So what you have to do is you have to, you have to be very careful about who you allow to touch your life, yeah. to influence your life. You have to be transformed and not conformed. Amen. We have to be intentionally guarding our heart and listening to the Holy Spirit and staying away from places that are going to trip us up, looking for the sick around us that need influence over them. In doing so, we become the hospital for the hurting people. Number two in your notes is this. So number one was do not. Jesus did not conform, but he transformed. Number two is this. Jesus understood that the most broken people are usually the most open people. Jesus understood that the most broken people are usually the most open people. Anybody in this room ever been broken? I don't know about you, but when I came to Jesus, I was broken. I was way broken. Everything was broken. And he fixed that. I think a lot of times what the church does is very similar to what the religious world did back in the day, is, is we kind of shy away from the most broken people. Y'all, the most broken people are damaged, right? They got drama. They need counseling. The most broken people, they give our church a specific name. You know, they're smoking outside and got dope going on back here. And on. The most broken people are the biggest risk in the church. Come on, y'all. Y'all know that's true. Y'all quiet. The most broken people. So what we do, what the church world typically does, is they're like, eh. (laughs) I mean, yeah, you can come in if you want to. You can be a part of the church if you want to. We kind of steer away. It's not like, hey, like, we see the doctor, or we see the lawyer, or we see somebody that looks good, and, and we're like, oh, come on in, baby, we'll open arms. But the people that kind of smell nasty and they got some foul language. Y'all, there's some people in this church got some foul language. I heard them. <laughs> Those people we kind of want to shy away from, they might give me a bad reputation. They might give my church a bad reputation. You know what I tell people when they cuss in front of me? I tell them, hey, if you're going to cuss, you better cuss. Don't you dare change your mouth because of me. You change your mouth because you want to change your mouth. Don't change your mouth because of me. I don't know why people do that in front of pastor. Amen? (laughs) Thank you. Everybody that cusses said amen, pastor. (laughs) (laughs) Jesus said this. He said, I have come. I have not come to call those that are righteous. Think that they're righteous. 
but knows, those that know that they're in need of a savior. Y'all, the truth is everyone in the world is broken. All of us are broken. And what Jesus is saying is I cannot help people that will not recognize their brokenness. I can only help people that will be authentic and they will be honest and they will share their brokenness in a way to allow me to heal it. I can help those people. I have not come for those that think that they're righteous. I have come for those that understand that we're all broke. Think about this, y'all. The religious people rejected Jesus, the savior of the world, yet the poor, the hated, the bottom of the barrel, the heathens, those that had not been brainwashed to think that because of my last name or because I'm a child of Abraham or because of my ritualistic things that I'm a child of God. No, 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 no. It was the other ones that were so accepted, accepted Jesus. Psalms chapter 51 and verse 17 says this. The sacrifice that you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, oh God. Y'all, it's funny to me because I think that most of the time we think the toughest ones to deal with are the most broken ones, the heathens, the ones that I was talking about a while ago. We think that those are the toughest ones to deal with because they're going to give us a bad reputation and they're going to all the things, right? But honestly, you know who the toughest ones to deal with in the church world? The toughest ones to deal with is the ones that think that they're already right. The toughest ones to deal with is these religious spirits that got to have church a certain way. The toughest ones to deal with is typically the ones that's been doing it for years and years and years and years and change begins to happen and they just throw up a guard on change just because it's change. It don't even matter if it's God, it's change. No. That ain't how we do it. That's the toughest ones to deal with. Give me all the crack addicts. All the crazy people. Amen? You know why? Because they're receptive to the gospel. Because the life change that typically happens when God puts their life back together is awesome. They're the easiest ones to deal with. Why? Because they're always hungry to learn more and to grow and to figure out what's next in my walk with Jesus Christ. Let me give you an example of each of these. (laughs) When Christy and I moved to Texarkana, we started a bus ministry and bus ministry inside of religious churches are a bad idea. We started a bus ministry, y'all, and it began to just, let me tell you how the bus ministry kicked off. It was so cool. So there was 17 very preppy white kids in our youth ministry. And I asked them, hey guys, you want to do fine arts where we go and like act and do drama? It costs thousands of dollars to do all that. Or do y'all want to change our city? It's completely up to y'all. You know what 17 out of 17 said? They said, let's change our city. How do we do that? And I said, that's my kids right there, baby. So we said, okay, we're going to take all of our youth offering and all, I started driving a bus for Texarkana ISD, all of my bus paycheck, we're going to buy stuff to go out and change the city. So we started doing food boxes. Yo, I got 95 toothbrushes for a (laughs) dollar. God opened this door for me to come into this thing called Harvest Texarkana. And so we start buying all this food. They start hearing about what we're doing and they're giving me diapers and they're just start giving me all this stuff. Brookshire or whatever the, 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 the place there, kind of like Brookshire Brothers there, they heard that I was doing that. So they started donating all of the donuts. All of the donuts came to, to, to Lighthouse Assembly of God. So I had, when kids ran into, yeah, this is dangerous, when kids ran into the youth room, 150 kids running into the youth room, the very first thing that they saw was this mountain of donuts. And they got to go pick their sprinkles. I mean, there's, there's everything in the donuts. The whole donut world is in our donuts. So, so we start working on this bus ministry. And what we would do is we would go out and we would pick a project area and we would spend all day there. We would play football with the kids basketball, all kind of, I mean, giving out diapers and food boxes and all the things. And, and this one day we went to this place called Griff King and most dangerous place in Texarkana. Uh, they actually tore it down and redid it because it was that bad. It was bad. I almost died there twice, literally. Uh, and so, uh, so we go to Griff King and it's in the daytime. We spend all day there and playing football with these youth and all the things. So at the end of the day, I said, um, there's this kid named Javante there. And I said, Hey, Javante, why don't you come to church? with me on Wednesday, come and ride the bus. And he literally said, F that, pastor. 
I ain't doing no church. That's, that's a kid's thing. He's like 16. Church is for kids. I've heard a lot of things. Church is for kids. That's one that I've never heard. So I said, okay. Well, I mean, don't worry about it. I'll be back to play football next week. We can hang out and play some football. So I go to walk off and I had like my favorite hat on and he turned back around. And he said, hey, preacher man. And I said, what's up? He said, I'll ride the bus with you Wednesday night. You going to give me that hat? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you show up, now I got this turmoil. Do I want him to? I'm just kidding. <laughs> if you show up Wednesday night, I'll give you my hat. He's like, all right, I'll be there. I'm going to ride. Just one time, though. Yeah, just one time. That's it. And so Javante gets on. JJ, he gets on the bus, and he comes with me. On the bus, he says, all right, bro, give me the hat. I had a backup hat because, you know, I always got to have a hat on. So I gave him my hat, put my other hat on. We get into church. That night, I preached about my testimony of who I was before Christ, everything that he did to rock my world. And Javante was on the front row, and he was listening, and he was listening. And I began to see tears in his eyes. And then at the very end, I did an altar call, and he came up to the front, and he just began to bawl. Amen. He said, hey, man, I've been dealing drugs for a long time. I, I, I want your life. I want God to change me. Like, if there is a God, I want him to change me. And so we prayed. He cried. He gave his life to Jesus Christ. And then right after that, it was like everything that I did, he wanted to be right behind me. Now, I want to learn it all. So I'm going. If I'm, he calls me every day. Matter of fact, I told this story one time about the kid that ran five miles to come my very last time to preach at that church. It was Javante. He ran five miles on a Sunday morning so that he could hear me preach my last message. God transformed his life because he was open. He was so open because he was so broken and in need of a savior. And because he was in need of a savior and I showed him what it looked like to go from living in hell in a life of death to a life of life, he changed his life. That's what I mean when I say broken people are the easiest because they're open. But I've also learned that religious people are hard, y'all. I pastored in on Alaska. When we pastor, let me give you an example of that. I pastored in on Alaska, and as I was pastoring in on Alaska, y'all, we had we started with like Mm, probably 50, 55 people in the church. And uh, so the church began to grow. I started a bus route. We started busing in 80 kids on this bus route. Let me tell you something. When you bring in bus kids, your church usually ain't pretty. Y'all been in our gym? Stuff spilled all over the walls. Con I don't know how they chip up concrete, but listen, they figure out a way. Doors falling off the hinges. I mean, I don't know. And so when you bring in bus kids, what happens is the church that used to be pretty because nobody was in it. Ooh. Now begins to have some issues. Brian knows he was with me. It was his fault, y'all. So what happens is we begin to bring in all these kids and all these people. We start hosting big events. Y'all know what happens when you bring in a whole bunch of people and host events? Things are dirty all the time. Cleaning lady comes on Friday, Thursday. We have an event on Friday. It ain't as clean on Sundays maybe as it was before we was doing the events. And then something got broke. It shouldn't have got broke. It was like the altar of the church. Right? And what happens is they're not focusing on the fact that people are getting saved and God is growing the kingdom. They're focusing on the fact of what they want church to be like. And so I had like 20 people come in and want to tell me, hey, we, we got to figure this thing out. Got to figure what thing out? These bus kids are coming in. They're trashing the church. They're this, they're that. They're, this thing shouldn't have got broke. It got broke. Everybody say stuff happens. That was my thing. It didn't work. <laughs> stuff happens didn't work with them. They, did, they could not focus on the fact that God was transforming lives. No, they got mad because they had this perfect picture view of what they wanted Sunday morning to be like. Sunday night, they wanted to have a Sunday night social. All of them wanted to sing. <laughs> you ever heard of Sunday singings? Oh, my God. I had to bring his name into it because it was that bad. Like, it... One time we had, uh, I can't even say, I can't go there. I'm sorry. We ain't going there. And so they, they had this picture perfect, like this is what we want church to be like. Sunday morning's got to go like this. Sunday night's going to go like this. Wednesday night's going to go like this. And you know what happened? What happened is the religious people, they split the church in half. And they decided, because we don't want the church to grow, we want our little social environment 
that we're taking our people and we're going to start a little social environment somewhere else. That's what they did. They divided the church of Jesus Christ because they were religious and because they did not really have God's heart in mind. They had what their heart had in mind and their heart is deceitful is what the Bible says. So is yours and mine, but theirs was real deceitful. (laughs) Listen to me, y'all. I have found in almost every case broken people who can see their need for a healing will be the most transformed people in the world. So what are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying we got to be a hospital for broken people. We can't focus on what the service should or shouldn't look like or should Trey have these goofy looking socks on the stage while he's running around with the camera or should. Listen, we can't focus on that stuff. What we have to focus is on the fact that people are dying, go to hell while we sit in here and do nothing. Somebody say, change your focus. Y'all, we're called to be a hospital for broken people to be healed. And I want to challenge you in your life. Look for broken people. Because where you see broken people is usually an invitation for you to let your deeds shine for all to see. So number one was Jesus did not conform He transformed. Number two, Jesus understood that most broken people are the most open people. Number three, Jesus offered hope through repentance. Jesus offered hope through repentance. You know, I'm going to throw this out there. Repenting for your sin and saying you're sorry is two completely different things. Let me give you a funny story real quick and then we'll dive in. So when I was in sixth grade, I think it was sixth grade, maybe seventh grade, I had this teacher named Miss Webb. And she, I don't remember if it was in Carthage or if it was at Central, but her name was Miss Me- Webb. She was a math teacher. Did anybody else have Miss Webb? Was this, this? Okay, okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you guys, I'll pray for you with me. I'm just kidding. She was a great teacher. Uh, and so Miss Webb, um, I, I, I was probably the best student in her class. <laughs> <laughs> But for whatever reason, she got really aggravated with me a lot. And so usually when she would get aggravated with me, then she would, you know, you could, you could see her blood start boiling. She would get aggravated and I would pop off and I would say, I'm sorry, Miss Webb. And she would turn and she would yell, don't you dare tell me you're sorry. <laughs> and I would say, what do you mean you don't want me to tell you she, that I'm sorry? And she said, I can remember it. She said, don't you tell me you're sorry because you're just going to do it again. And if you're just going to do it again, you're not sorry. So don't say it. When you decide to change your actions, you can say you're sorry. She was right, y'all. So it's kind of a funny thing in my family. About 10 years ago, my wife was doing something that really irritated me. She knows that it irritated me. And it irritated me all the time. And I'm always saying something for it. And she would always say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And yet she would still do it all the time. And so one day she says, I'm sorry. And I jumped up and I said, don't you dare say you're sorry. (laughs) And she looked over at me and she said, why not? And I said, because you're just going to do it again. And if you're going to do it again, then you are not sorry. So don't say it. And she said, well, then I'm not sorry that I did it. I'm sorry that it offended you. So now in our home, usually when one of us say we're sorry, it's always going with, I'm sorry that you were mad about it, or I'm sorry that that offended you. I'm not sorry for what I did. I'm sorry for you. Oh, y'all, we need prayer. (laughs) Listen to, I believe so many times that what we do with God is what I did with Miss Webb. You know, we do something stupid. We make poor decisions and choices. And what we do is we come down and we say, God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that I did that. And then we get up and we go back out this week and we make the same mistake. And then we come back and we're in church Sunday. 
we go back down. Lord, I'm so sorry. I wonder how many times God's looking down on us and he's going, are you, are you kidding me? Are you, are you sorry, huh? You already know you're going to do it again this week. Don't tell me you're sorry because nothing is changing in your life. When you decide to change, then you can say you're sorry. Repentant. It says Jesus offered hope through, help me out, through repentance. What is repentance? To repent, thank you, means to turn away, to turn away from. If I'm sinning and I repent, I'm no longer there. I'm going this way. Repentance is absolute and ultimate, unconditional surrender to God. It does include sorrow and regret, but it's much more than that. In repenting, one makes a complete change of direction for their life towards God. Jesus offered hope through repentance. He didn't offer hope through, I'm saying sorry. He offered hope through your actions changing. And your actions change when you turn away from your sin and you turn to God. Somebody say amen. Amen. Acts chapter 3 and verse 19 says, Now repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Everybody say, that's our hope. hope. Proverbs 28 and 13 says, people who conceal their sin will not prosper. But if they confess and turn from their sin, they will receive mercy. Now, let's go back to our scripture for today. Jesus did not call those who think that they are righteous. He called those, I'm going to say it my way, who acknowledge that they are a sinner that they have sin and he's calling them to repentance. And through repentance, we become healed and we become saved and we get all of the joys of salvation through repentance. So this morning, I'm asking you in here, would you search your hearts? Have you truly repented? Have you confessed and turned away from your sin? Or have you just been saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and continuing to live in the sin that you have? Listen, if you've been living in your sin, today is the day to repent. Today is the day to not just confess, but confess and turn away. Everybody say, today's the day. Also, I want to say, listen to me, this is so important. This hope through repentance is not just for us to hold on to. That hope through repentance is for us to share that hope with others, believing that they will repent too. To conclude us this morning, Jesus hasn't called us to have a us versus them mentality. He's called us to be salt and be light. He's called us to be a hospital to the world around us that's hurting and in need of him. And we do that by not conforming to the world, but by being transformed by Christ. We do that by understanding that broken people are not the problem in church. Broken people are the most open in church. And we do that by understanding that Jesus offered hope through repentance. So in order for us to walk in that hope, we have to truly repent. And then we show the world the hope through the repentance that we have. Would you stand with me this morning? As you're standing, I'm going to ask for our worship team to step out and come join me on the stage and begin to sing. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to ask our altar team, would you guys step out and come to the front? Every head bowed and every eye closed. Holy Spirit, I ask right now that you would begin to woo, that you would begin to draw, that you would begin to move that you would begin to get us prepared for what you want to do this morning. Every head bowed and every eye closed. First of all, I believe that all of my heart that Jesus is calling people to repentance this morning. Not calling them to an altar, not calling them to to say I'm sorry, but that Jesus is calling us to repent this morning. And if if that's you and the Lord's talking to you and the Holy Spirit is wooing you and drawing you to repentance in just a minute, when we start to sing this song, would you come find a place where you can not just confess, but that you can confess 
that you can leave your sin here and that you can stand up and you can begin to make a 180 degree turn in your life and begin to follow God. I know that God is speaking that to you right now. I've been praying for you. Do not wait another day. Do not wait until the time is too late. Today is the day of repentance. With every head bowed and every head closed, if you're in here this morning and you need prayer, whether that's you need prayer for healing, whether you're struggling with a hard time, your marriage is in trouble, your finances are in trouble, and you need God to give you wisdom and direction, if you need something from God and the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and leading you and guiding you, we have a prayer team that would love to pray for you. In just a second, we're going to start this song. As we start this song, can I just urge you, will everyone stay for one song? Can we sing and worship and love on God through one song? And as you're singing in this song, if the Holy Spirit's moving you or you know that you need to be at the altar or you need someone to pray for you, please don't wait. Step out and come. Step out and repent. Step out and get the prayer that you need to get today. Heavenly Father, I love you so much. God, as we give this over to you, I pray right now that your Holy Spirit would begin to draw us, draw us to repentance, draw us to move forward, draw us to allow you to transform our lives. In Jesus' name, I pray. Come on, right now. If you know you need to be at the altar, would you step out and come right now? Yes, yes.